Hello. Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. My guest operated in an amazing realm of healings and miracles. This made him a threat to the realms of darkness. Satan tried to obliterate him with a cold, calculated assault by murdering his wife. It's been an incredibly difficult week, a, a week, a time, circumstances I never dreamed, imagined I would ever be dealing with on a personal level. And uh, we're dealing with it. Uh, like I said in our Facebook post, I'm a man on a mission. Now I got a chip on my shoulder. We were going at this thing uh, with a shotgun, and now I'm going at it with an Abrams tank. It was clearly an attack of the devil against me. He went after my wife, but we will go forward, and I'm going to make him pay. It's supernatural. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Go and flow. Chad Gonzalez has devoted his life to helping believers look at Jesus' life as their floor and not their ceiling. His gift of healings and miracles were advancing to greater levels, but this made him a threat. Satan had a sinister plot to defeat his ministry's momentum and Chad's faith. Chad, what happened? Well, my son, Jake, and I, he's 14 years old. We, uh, we went to a ministry trip to Dallas, Texas. It was the first dad and lad ministry trip we'd ever taken together. We're, we're heading back from Dallas to Tampa. We've got about a seven hour time frame and we get on our first flight. And uh, about, a, uh, about an hour into the flight, uh, somehow my phone rings 30,000 feet up in the air. It's the county sheriff. And he said, Mr. Gonzalez, I don't know how to tell you this. He said, 911 was called, arrived at your home, and your wife was unresponsive. We tried to revive her and couldn't get her back. And he said, uh, we didn't want you, you know, waiting this entire time trying to figure out what was going on, wanted to prepare you ahead of time. And you can imagine, you're stuck on a plane. You can't, you can't call anybody, you can't go anywhere. And you have your son next to you to I've explain it I've got my son to. right next to me. I'm trying to protect him. And so for seven hours, hmm. I, I took husband Chad and uh, I put him in a box. I refused to allow my son to have to go through what I was going through for seven hours. Uh, I'm, I'm controlling my soul, I'm controlling my emotions because everybody that knew me, my plan was simple. We're raising her up. There's only one other option. And I get to the Tampa airport, it's three o'clock in the morning, I've got to tell my son, because we've got to go back to the house, the police are there. So the next morning, they, they do the autopsy. We found a tumor on her colon, and that tumor had punctured her small intestine and caused her to go into septic shock. And that's what took her out. And so as you can imagine, like, here we are. I mean, I'm a healing guy, faith guy. We're seeing miracles all over the place. And this happens to my wife. And so we're just in shock and, and numb and trying to figure out what's going on. I've got questions. I mean, for what I believe, what we're doing, going after, I've got serious questions. I go to sleep that night and I have a dream. And in that dream, I'm standing and there's a lion. And the lion's kind of walking around. It doesn't see me just yet. I'm staying very still. All of a sudden, the lion looks up. It sees me and it begins to charge at me. Well, instead of me retreating, I began to run toward the lion. And as I got very close to the lion, stopped, stood up on its back legs and grabbed a zipper and pulled the zipper down, pulled off the top and it was a man in a lion outfit. And the man turned around in the lion outfit, began to run, tripped over, hit its head on a rock and began to bleed out. And I woke up. But immediately, two scriptures came to my mind. Number one, Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour. Yet number two, you resist the devil and he will flee. And so many Christians think that we're on defense when it comes to Satan. No, no, no. Jesus made us more than a conqueror. He made us a victory. He put us on offense. And we have to know who we are because you don't run from a lion. You become the lion and you run after the lion, especially a fake one. And I found out in that moment, number one, this was an attack. 
ultimately against me and the ministry that we stood for, the call that was on our life, what we were going after, the mission that we had. But number two, I realized I was in the position spiritually that I needed to be to handle the situation because I ran after the lion. So my intent, we're going to raise this girl up. We've got a job to do. And so I, I'm not allowing myself to feel. I've taken all my emotions and put them aside. I've got a job to do. The funeral home wasn't going to allow us to be there till Thursday. We've had no contact at all because of all the legal stuff. So two of my very best friends, they come down and they, we go to my ministry office. This is on Wednesday afternoon and we begin to pray. I'm not seeking after anything, just direction. We've been praying in tongues for an hour and a half. I'm sitting on the ground. I've got my eyes closed and all of a sudden, and I know this is going to sound so strange, but all of a sudden I felt her, I felt Lacey. And I said this with my eyes closed, I said, you just got a whole lot closer to me than what you were. And immediately the Lord gave me a vision. And when I say I saw her, I saw her like you right here, but she was standing behind this translucent veil. And she's, she's wearing this long gown, white gown, and, and I can see her behind this veil. It's got kind of a shimmer of, of blue, blue and kind of purple to it. And she's standing there smiling at me. And all of a sudden she walks up to the veil and she presses her face up against it. And she takes her hand and she sticks her hand through that veil and, and pushes all the way through to her face and her shoulder up against it. And she's got her hand out. And I opened my eyes and I told my friends, I said, guys, I've got to tell you what just happened. She was here, like I felt her, and I just saw her. I told him about the veil in her hand. Well, we instantly took that as, this is going to happen. We're going to raise her up. She's standing there waiting for us to pull her yeah, over. I would have taken it that way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's your soul. That's what you're wanting and desiring. And this, this sense keeps coming to me. You interpreted that wrong. She's not waiting on you to pull her over. She's waiting on you to come. Hmm. And I fought it. I was like, devil, shut up. I fought it and fought it and fought it. And I finally had to come to the realization that God was trying to show me this was her decision that she was staying. Well, as you can imagine, I, I, I grab a hold of that reality. I, I brought husband Chad back. And, you know, so many times we, we see ministers and we think, oh, they're like superheroes, superman, don't feel anything, everything's great. No, 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 you're human. And you have emotions and feelings and family and loved ones. It was like somebody just took half of me and just ripped it out. I, I was numb. I didn't know how to feel. For three days, I'm not eating anything. I'm not feeling anything. Well, then one of my other best friends, David Porter, he calls me. This is on a Sunday. He said, Chad, I've got to tell you something. This is, there's a pastor named Nancy Dufresne over in California. And there was a meeting on Wednesday night. Now, remember, I had this vision mm -hmm. when I saw Lacey behind that veil on Wednesday afternoon at around 530. Nancy Dufresne is preaching a conference at 7 p.m. And she begins to relay this vision that Clara Grace, this prophetess back in the 60s, had. She said, God allowed me to see that there were people that had gone before standing behind a veil, veil of glory, mm -hmm. and he would allow some of them to cross that veil and come into this realm and bring things from heaven. And he would allow those that were mature men, women, and children to, that were in this realm to cross through that veil into the realm of heaven and take things of heaven and bring them back. Sid, I can't tell you what that did for me. Because, you know, you, you have something supernatural, sovereign act of God like that, but you also have the emotions that are involved. And for days, then you start to kind of question things. And then you see the, the grace of God in this entire thing, and it instilled a fire on the inside of me. And so people began to look at me and like, how, how could you be like this? How could you have a smile on your face? You don't realize what God did for me. That there, this isn't talked about enough in church about grief and, and sorrow and this and that, because I began to look at Jesus, and there's a powerful story with Jesus, and nobody pays attention to it. And it's when he finds out that John the Baptist was beheaded. This is his cousin. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that Jesus withdrew into a boat, and he crossed over. But as soon as he landed, people found out that he was there. And Jesus didn't retreat from the mission. People were telling me, oh, you need to take off. You need to take a year off, take months off from ministry. The grief hasn't hit you. The sorrow hasn't really hit you. But I went back and looked at Jesus. I don't care about anybody else's example. I looked at Jesus. Jesus withdrew for a moment, but as soon as he lands, you know what he does? He has compassion on their sick and he heals the sick. And then one of the greatest miracles ever recorded was the feeding of the 5,000, and it happened right after John the Baptist was mm. beheaded. Jake, you're
He said some pretty profound things to you. I've been so impressed with him. He, he's just a, he's a champion. And I'm having to tell him that his mama's not here anymore. We're crying and holding each other and, and just, just tears flowing. And I told him, I said, hey, you know what we believe? And you know, you know what the plan is? And he said, yeah, Dad, I know. He said, I know this wasn't God. I, he said, I know this was the devil. And he goes, you know, Dad, I know that you would never let Satan do anything to you. And I know that you would never let him do anything to me. But you couldn't control Mom's thoughts. And then he said this, he said, Mom was a sitting duck. Not many people knew it, but for the, the prior two years, she had been struggling with some pretty serious depression and anxiety. And I'd never told, I'd never told anybody. But for years, it didn't come up all the time, but every once in a while there was a fear in her that she was gonna die young and not be there for Jake. And I was amazed that in the heat of this situation, he just found out his mama just moved to heaven and has the spiritual insight to understand that we've got the authority. And it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a criticism against Lacey at all. I was so proud of her because she was winning and, and she was fighting back. But it was the fact of, we'd been talking about our soul, we'd been talking about our imaginations, and we've got the authority over Satan. But, but he's coming after our soul, he's coming after our thoughts. And he brings these thoughts and ideas and deceptions and, and, and he's trying to, trying to get us to connect our soul to the curse. And so just the fact that Jake realized that, it just amazed me. And I told him, I said, well, look, buddy, I said, we're going to learn from this. I said, from this moment forward, no fear in our house, no fear in our thoughts. And we're going to take every teachable moment from this situation and not allow Satan to get any victory out of this. And we're going to make him pay for what he did to our, our mom and my wife. Uh, Chad says our battles can become divine catalysts to propel us into greater glory. Explain this. We'd well, you know, already had a fire burning on the inside of me. I mean, we're, we've got a mission. And you know, Satan brought this attack and he brought it to try to make me quit, but all it did was tick me off. It, it was like somebody poured gasoline on the fire that was already in me. It was just a few weeks after Lacey had gone on to heaven and I'm watching the movie Braveheart. I've watched this movie many, many times, but I'm watching it for the first time a different way. You have this great Scottish warrior and the English are trying to do some things. And, and so what they do is they murder his wife. And he had a choice there because it really, it wasn't against his wife, it was against him. And they murdered his wife. And instead of him quitting, it just fueled a fire and he led a revolution and got their independence. And it hit me, this is me. It just, it fueled something even greater. And I, I watched as we were walking out this story over this last year, it was just the grace of God, the grace of God, and what he did for, for my son. And then God does, did a miracle in and of itself, another supernatural story. And they brought us a wonderful woman named April. And it was just an absolute miracle in what happened and brought her to, to Jake and I. And, and we got married and she became my wife. She became his bonus mom. And with her, there was, she's got a wonderful daughter and son named Savannah and Logan and just watch the grace of God and, and blending a family. And now things have just increased even more. And, and just to see where God took a tragedy and turned it into a triumph, where Satan tried to make you quit. And I mean, this is my attitude. The Bible says if Satan would have known what was gonna be the result of crucifying Jesus, he wouldn't have done it. Ever. My goal, my endeavor is that every single day, Satan regrets touching my wife now, are you ready to make the devil's greatest regret that he ever touched you? We will be right back to It's Supernatural. What's some of the biggest things that you've been able to pull from this, learn from this. Uh, don't take moments for granted. There are like a lot of moments that like I could have like hung out with her or like done stuff with her, but like I decided not to. Like I really just like kick myself because of it. 
but like I have to just try not to think about it and not like focus on it. Definitely controlling your thoughts, controlling your thought life and keeping your mind focused on God and the right things. Like that's probably the biggest thing because that's like the big thing she struggled with and ultimately what did everything. Yeah, so maintaining your thought life. Mm -hmm. That's what we talk about too, like Colossians 3, to set your mind on the realities of heaven. Um, everybody has a responsibility of maintaining their thought life, but it's been a piece of, of a little bit of guilt. There's always those thoughts that come and I have to push them away. If, if it wasn't for me, she'd probably still be alive. Obviously I can't control her thoughts and to see her taken out and know it was because of what we stand for and what we're going after. But, but the spiritual reality is the fact that really when someone dies, they don't die, it's their body that dies. They just change addresses. And I'm so thankful that, you know, my 14 year old son here has got a, a better grasp and understanding of the fact that, yeah, we're hurting, but at the same time, she's, she's more alive now than ever. Because remember, I, I told you, we're gonna make, we're gonna take these things and we're gonna make these teachable moments. We now return to It's Supernatural. Chad found renewed determination after Satan's attack. Instead of retreating, it pushed Chad to advance beyond his comfort zone and to ponder the question, why we settle for less when we're called for so much more? Yes, yeah, so if you look at you look at our society, there's advancement all over the place. You look at technology, how it's continuing to increase. You look at the business world, there's advancement everywhere. But if we're really honest, we humble ourselves and take a step back and look at the church, there hasn't really been much advancement. I mean, you even see it with denominations. Lester Summerall made this statement. He said, the vast majority of Christians, they never progress past their first revelation of God. That's so sad. It's so sad, but it's so true. You look at it, I mean, every major denomination started off with a great revelation mm -hmm. of God and then stopped. And so many times we see these moves of God, instead of using those to propel ourselves mm -hmm. to the next one, we make a camp there and that's where you die. You're either advancing or you're dying. And we see Jesus, here's Jesus doing life as a man. Yes, anointed by God, filled with God, united with one. Yes, he's God, but he's doing life as a man, filled with God. And Jesus makes this statement in John chapter five, and this has been a, a foundational scripture for me. He said, for the father loves the son and shows him all the things that he himself does. And he's gonna show him even greater things than these, just so you would marvel. Here's Jesus, Jesus is expecting greater, but it also shows me that the greater wasn't going to come just from knowing more scriptures. It comes from knowing your God. And yet you also see, he says, it's because the Father loves the Son, he loves me. And you see Jesus is pushing, he's, he's pushing for greater, pushing for greater so that the world would know him. Well, you have to ask yourself the question, does God love me? Well, yes, Jesus says in John 17, for as the Father loves me, he loves you. Well, if he loves me just as much as he loves Jesus, that means I'm in the very same position to see the secrets of God. God isn't hiding things from us, he's hiding things for us, but, but it's the fellowship piece that's been missing in our faith walks, that this intimacy with him, to hear from him and see from him, not so we can go around and have more followers on Facebook, you know, I'm so fed up with, with, with the, the fame and fortune of the ministers and stuff today. It's not about that. It's about Him. It's about fellowship with the Father so we can manifest the Father. <laughs> manifest the Father to a world that doesn't, doesn't know Him. Even Jesus said, this generation is seeking a sign. Well, I don't take that as condemnation. I, I take it as reality. We have a very carnal world that needs to see and hear and feel, experience Him to know the reality of him. And yet Jesus goes on in John 14, 12, and he says, whoever believes in me, he didn't say the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, whoever, the teacher, the lawyer, the doctor, the landscaper, businessman, whoever believes in me will not only do the same, but will actually do even greater because I'm going to the Father. And people say, well, how's that possible? How could you do greater than Jesus? It's because Jesus, he came to live in me. 
And so the Christ, because I became one with him, I became his body, you became his body. We become the hands and feet of Jesus so we can advance and do even greater. And that's, that's what we've been telling people and we've gotten flack for it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the works that Jesus did on the earth, people look at that as the ceiling for what's available for the church. No, 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 it's the floor. We've got to change our perspective and get hungry and begin to spend time knowing the Father and hearing and seeing from Him so He can show us even greater things so we can turn around and we can do those things. We've got to go after it. Chad, explain storms mm. and Pharisees. Well, I've experienced this, and all those that are determined to go forward will experience it. We see where Jesus gets on the boat, and they're going across the sea. Uh, this great windstorm is a demonic storm that arises, and we see Jesus speak to it, calm it, still it, and they cross over the other side. And much of our focus on that story is the authority of Jesus over the storm. Mm -hmm. But what we forget about is the purpose behind that storm. And the purpose of that storm was to stop them from getting to the other side. Jesus went with the intent to deliver the madman of Gadara, because that madman was, was controlling that region of the country. Nobody could pass through, nobody could do it. The kingdom couldn't be manifest there because of demonic activity. And the purpose of Jesus crossing that sea was to set that man free. And the purpose of that storm was to stop Jesus. He took authority over it and he went away. He had a mission. And that's why people look at me and, and some people judge me. And, and I'm, I'll be honest, it's ticked me off because they see me happy. They see me continue to push forward. And some people have even, even made the comment, oh, he must have not really loved Lacey. I mean, do you want to tick me off? Tell me I didn't love my wife. But, but what people don't understand is they're looking at it from a very sinner, carnal, earthly standpoint and not looking at life from a kingdom perspective is that we've got a mission to fulfill. And it doesn't matter if you've lost a loved one. It doesn't matter if you've lost this and lost that. Those things do not change the mission. We've got a mission to fulfill. And you've got to look at it from a kingdom mindset. And that's where Jake and I, we've told people, you've got to look at loss. You've got to look at death. You've got to look at it from a kingdom perspective. That when that person dies, really that person didn't die. They just left their body. And they're very much alive. And that's what that, that vision did for me. And seeing her behind the veil, I saw her more alive. I saw her smiling, laugh. And that's what drives me every single day as I study, I pray. I want to know more. Why? I'm not concerned about being famous. I want to be faithful. I want to fulfill the mission. I want people to know him. Give us, give us a few pointers that'll make a difference so we can advance. Well, we just mentioned about the storms. You got to know that storms are going to come. So don't get dismayed about the storm. So many people, the storm comes and they think they did something wrong. No, no, no. I found out when you're doing something right, that's when you become a target. So, so when, the, when the storms come, that doesn't upset me. Because I'm such a rebel, when the storm comes, it just invigorates me because I know I'm headed in the right direction. But you also have to understand there's going to be Pharisees. There's going to be critics trying to give you advice. There's always going to be people that know a lot of Scripture, but they don't know Him. And they're going to tell you, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. And so that's where you've got to learn to block out the critics and not be worried about, please, I could care less. I love people, absolutely love people, but I don't care about their opinion about me. Because if, if, if you're moved by the praises of people, you're going to die by their criticisms. We also have to understand the fact that it really is this, either you're advancing or you're dying. And that's why there's been a lull in the church for decades. There's no advancement. Why is it that the world doesn't want anything to do with the church? Because the church doesn't have anything visibly that the world thinks that they can have. I mean, you know, during COVID, everybody is screaming, we're essential, we're essential. You're not essential unless you have something that they don't have. So we've got to be essential. You know how we're essential? We manifest the glory. How are we essential? We continue to advance. How we become essential? We manifest Jesus like the world has never seen before. Well, the way to be essential is to have what Chad has, and that is the Messiah himself living inside of you, talking to you, directing you, guiding you. I want you to say a prayer and mean it to the best of your ability. Dear God, Dear God I've made many mistakes, I've made many mistakes. And, I'm so sorry. and I'm so sorry. I believe, I believe your, blood, Jesus your blood, Jesus, 
Wash us away my sins. And I am clean. Jesus, come and live inside of me. Make your home here. Amen. Amen. Chad, pray for people right now. Friend, I just want to pray for you right now. I want to encourage you. If you're going through a storm, if you're going through a trial, hey, you know what? I understand. Been there, done that. But here's the deal. I came through it and I won. And if you feel like you're going through hell, here's my encouragement to you. Keep going through because there's always victory on the other side. And if you've gone through a loss, you've gone through an experience like that, you know what? I've got good news for you too. Because Jesus, He not only came to heal a broken bone, He came to heal a broken heart. And no amount of counseling can do what Jesus came to do for you. He'll take it out in a moment where you don't have to grieve like the world grieves and sorrow like the world sorrows. You can have a heavenly perspective and heavenly mindset. And so, Father, I just pray for them right now that you would open their eyes and help them to see things from the perspective of heaven, that the realities of heaven become a very real reality for them, and that the peace that surpasses all understanding would begin to mount guard and garrison around their heart and around their mind, and you would open up to them the plan that you have for their life. So that would be the food that drives them every single day to one day stand before their Jesus and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, you may be going through a storm, may be facing a giant in your life, and if you are, I can relate. You have to realize there's a purpose behind the storm. It's very important for us to realize that God is a good God. He's not the one sending the storms. He's not the one sending the trials. He's not the one sending the sickness and disease. There is an adversary out there called the devil, and he's trying to stop you. But the only way that he can stop you is for you to quit. And I want to encourage you, don't quit. And so in this book, Advance, and in the devotional, we give you 40 biblical principles on how to fulfill the plan of God for your life, but not settle for the status quo. These are things I've implemented every single day and having the right mindset, having the right perspective and literally looking at the life of Jesus and how he even handled grief. You know, people will tell you that when you're going through the greatest storm of your life, you need to pull back, you need to retreat. But we don't see that with Jesus. We see Jesus pushing to advance, not settling, but always pushing for greater, always pushing for increase. So I want to encourage you in this book, grab a hold of these principles. These are things, they're real, they're scriptural, they're also practical that you can use in your everyday life. We also have a CD entitled Final Frontier, A Future Beyond the Storms and Pharisees. And you need to be able to push past the critics. You need to be able to push past the storms. And if you do that, friend, I'm, I'm telling you, there's hope, hope and through all this, whatever you're going through, there's hope. We've been there, done that, and we've come out on the other side, not only victorious, We've come out on the other side increasing. We've come out on the other side advancing. He can turn that, that storm and let it be a catalyst to push you forward and go where no man or no woman of Christ has ever gone before. Make the devil's greatest regret that he ever touched you. Call or go online at sidroth.org 9977 for Chad's brand new book and 40-day devotional, Advance, plus his exclusive CD, The Final Frontier all for a donation of $35. Shipping and handling is included.